I'm going to turn it over here to the page. You know, in our country, and, uh, you know, I think about this. Last night, um, we went out to eat dinner, and my dad and my brother came with us, and they took a separate car because my, some of my dad's favorite shows came on last night. And he wanted to make sure he could get back to the room to watch these shows. But, you know, uh, in the country that we live in today, uh, the United States, we are known to have uh, what many believe the best judicial system in the world. We know it's not perfect, but many say that it's, it's the, the, the best system out there. Now, I know that uh, um, we know it's not perfect, like I said, but in America, the justice system is where we go to solve our problems, you know, uh, and it's also a huge business. And, uh, you know, I, I said that about my father because last night, I don't know exactly, was it CSI or? Okay, whatever. <laughs> Had nothing to do with my mom, I can guarantee you. But uh, anyway, I think it was NCIS, but there's a lot of shows that uh, the American people like to watch that have to do with, you know, uh, catching the bad guys, you know, whether it's um, uh, your Judge Judy, where people are going on there to solve their problems, or whether it's CSI. Americans love these types of shows. And I think it's not something new. You go all the way back to the, the days of the, the, the long, you know, uh, Ranger, you know, getting the bad guys. People like to see that. But it's also a big business, and when I say it's a big business, also mean there are countless numbers of students that every year enroll to be attorneys. And if you ever look at the statistics on it, it's kind of scary, but very few of them actually make it big. Most of them uh, uh, don't, don't get to drive those nice Mercedes and live in the big mansions. But, you know, it's, it's a business. But have you ever wondered why so many of these shows are successful? And why so many people, and it's because this judicial system that we have in our country. Now, <clears throat> I believe that we've all seen the statue before of the lady standing out in front of the courts and this statue is a woman that's blindfolded and she's holding scales in one hand and she's got the, the sword. And this is a statue of the Roman uh, goddess of justice. Now this go goddess of justice originally dates back to Egypt when you look it up and she was the one that assisted Osiris in the judgment of the dead by weighing their hearts. And that's what she weighed in those scales. But let's fast forward to today, to you and, you know, our time. If you were on trial for some particular reason, you know, although we have the best judicial system out there, would you want someone blindfolded, so to speak, holding scales, weighing what the, the popular consent is? That would be the jury. Allowing them to decide whether or not you're guilty or innocent. Well, I want to start over, you know, or start off by going to Matthew chapter 27. When you want the eyes of justice to be, uh, you know, would you want that? Would you want that in your circumstance? Now, I do realize that this statue is just a uh, representation of supposedly a fair and non-biased court system. But would you want that? Let's go over to Matthew chapter 27, and we're going to go over to verse 19. And we're reading here at the, at the time of Christ, and this is, uh, this is Pilate, and it says, Now as he sat on the judgment seat, his wife sent a message to him saying, Let there be nothing between you and the righteous man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priest and the elders persuaded the multitudes to demand Barbarius to be, uh, to demand Barbarius and to destroy Jesus. Then the governor answered and said to them, Which of the two do you desire that I release to you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? And they all said to him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil did he commit? But they shouted all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. And now Pilate, seeing that he was accomplishing nothing, but that a riot was developing instead, took water and washed his hands, and the multitude saying, I am, a guilt, I am guiltless of the blood of this righteous man, you see to it. Now, that's a story that we've read many times. But if you look 
in the past several years, you know, if you look at various judges that have sat on, sat on trials, there have been people. Uh, when, you, when you watch a lot about, uh, for example, the O.J. Simpson trial, the, the you know, various documentaries will say the reason why he was found not guilty was because they dropped the ball on the Rodney King trial that took place a few years before that. And that they were worried about these riots. It's exactly what you see here with Pilate. They were worried about riots. They were not worried about making a righteous decision. They were not worried about judging correctly. They were worried about that consent of the public. And this is exactly what you see with Pilate. Pilate knew that Christ was a just man, but yet the people wanted him killed. And what did he do? And you can ask you, you know, did, did this washing of his hands cleanse him? Was he innocent of Christ's uh, blood? If we read in verse 24 a little closer, you see that Pilate admits that he is allowing a just man to be murdered. Now, Pilate was more than just a judge. I mean, he had far more power than any judge today in our system. And yet, he still was more worried about what the people felt, the people that were rioting. He was trying to keep the peace, so to speak. Now, Christ was not just an innocent man. He was a perfect man. He was guilty of nothing. You know, some people will go to trial and they'll be found guilty. And you can say, well, they were not guilty of that specific thing, but we all know that they were not perfect and they were guilty of other things. Still doesn't make it right. But Christ was pure and righteous, but yet that mob wanted him killed. If a judge cannot even judge correctly when a perfect man is standing in front of him, then we have a problem. And let's go over to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 18. Exodus chapter 18 and verse 13. And on the next day it came to pass that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood by Moses from the morning to the evening. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did for the people, he said, What is this thing which you do for the people? Why do you sit alone by yourself and all the people stand by you from morning to evening? And Moses said to the father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. And when they, had, uh, when they have a matter, they come to me, and I judge between one and another, and I make known the statues of God and his law. And Moses' father-in-law said to him, the thing that you do is not good. And when you look at this, Moses was just, he was taking so much on himself. And his father-in-law saw this and was, and was trying to show him that he needed to delegate. And you will uh, surely wear away both you and the people that are with you, for this is too much of a burden for you. You are not able to perform this alone. And we go on down. And you realize this is where Moses begins to set up that Levitical priesthood. And, you know, that, that is going to inquire about God's law, his ordinances when situations come up. And what does God think of this? But more importantly, not just the letter of the law, knowing, knowing the spirit of the law. Well, let's go over to 1 Kings. And I realize that... Uh, the, the message yesterday had to do a lot with that putting of the law of God inside of us, that kingdom of God inside of us. And we go over to 1 Kings and we uh, read in chapter 3 and verse 6. And Solomon said, and you know, you fast forward to the days of Solomon. And Solomon said, you have shown to your servant David my father great mercy according as he walked before you in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of the heart with you. And you have kept this great kindness for him that you have given him a son to sit on the throne as it is today. O oh now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king instead of David my father, and I am a little child. I do not know how to go or to come. And you stop right there and you, 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 Solomon is humbling himself before God. And he's saying, he's seeing all these wonderful things that God did for his father. 
And now this kingdom is being put upon him, and, and he's humbly telling God, I don't even know how to come or go. You know, um, parents, when you have younger children, you know, you, you, you had to dress them to get them ready to bring them to church today. As they get a little older, you start giving them a little more freedom. You lay the clothes on their bed, and they have to put them on, right? And then eventually you think that they can dress themselves, and then you find out, no, they can't. <laughs> we got to put their clothes back on the bed again. But what you see here with Solomon is he's humbling himself. He's realizing this kingdom is being put on him. Now, you know, recently... I was, it was actually this week I was watching, when it was raining, I was watching some old Twilight Zone episodes up in the room. Are you watching them too? And there was one about the genie. And this genie appeared before this uh, little old man, a little old lady that had a little shop, and they had three wishes, and you know how this goes. And the first wish was you can't wish for more wishes, right? But no matter what they asked for, they would be given. The first thing they asked for was a million dollars. You know, this was back in black and white film, you know, a million dollars was a lot of money back then. Um, and the money falls down, well then of course an IRS guy shows up. <laughs> Takes just about all their money. But here Solomon is, he can ask God for anything, right? And what does he ask for? Let's, let's go on and read a little further down. And it says, and God said to him, or excuse me, we'll go up to uh, number nine, or excuse me, eight, and your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen numerous people who cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Now, therefore, give to your servant, this is what Solomon asked for, an understanding heart to judge your people to discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this? Who is able to judge your great people? And the word of God in the eyes of the Lord that Solomon had asked for this, you know, that had to be a pleasing thing to God. That Solomon didn't ask for, for his days to, to, to be extended. He didn't ask for this. He didn't ask for that. He asked for an understanding heart so that he could judge righteously. And God said to him, because you have asked for this thing and have not asked for yourself a long life, have not asked for riches, have not asked for the life of your enemies, but you yourself understanding to judge justly. Now, I bring that up is because what? That is what you and I are supposed to be learning today. That's what you and I are supposed to be learning as we go through this life. We're supposed to be learning how to have an understanding heart. And that's what Solomon understood. Let's go over to um, Solomon, uh, let's see, in verse, oh, we're going to drop down to verse 27, excuse me. <clears throat> in verse 27, we see, you know, a little bit of, of what Solomon receives. And it says, and the king answered and said, give her the living child and in no way kill it. She is the mother of it. Now, this is the very familiar scripture that we've heard before where two women were claiming that a young infant was their child. And this one said it was hers, and this one said it was his or hers. And Solomon, not knowing which one, having the wisdom, having that understanding heart, what does he do? And the king answered and said, Give her the living child and in no way kill it. She is the mother of it. And I actually skipped over a lot of what we were going to read. But what we know that Solomon did was, is he asked him to kill the, the child. And the mother that said, no, no, no. She identified herself as the mother by caring. What a blessing would it be to have understanding heart and to judge as Solomon did. Now let's go over to uh, Nehemiah. <coughs> Excuse me. And we'll go over to uh, the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8. And we'll, we'll go down to, and let's see, in chapter 8, go down to verse 13. <laughs> it 
And on the second day, the chief of the father of all the people and the priests and the Levites were gathered to Ezra the scribe, even to understand the words of the law. And they found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded by Moses, that the children of Israel shall dwell in booths in the feast of the seventh month. And they should publish and proclaim in all their cities in Jerusalem, saying, Go forth into the mountain, bring olive branches, oil trees, branches, and myrtle branches, and palm branches, and branches of thick trees to make it make booths as it is written. And the people went out and brought them and made themselves booths, each one upon his roof and in the, their courts and in the courts of the house of God and the streets of the water gate and the street of Ephraim and all the congregation who again in the captivity made booths. Also day by day from the first day until the last day he read the book of the law of God. You know, a few years ago I... I had heard many sermons on what the Feast of Tabernacles represented. But it was when I come to understand that one of the things that was done was the book of law, the book of the law was read from beginning to end during the Feast of Tabernacles. And I wondered, why, why is this? Why is it? And, you know, when you think of, of Solomon asking for that understanding heart, you know, The multitude of people that are going to come to understand that things are not the way that they thought they were. You, you see in, in Europe on the news, there was these great multitudes of, of individuals moving from one country uh, to another a few months back. They were going into Germany, and these people were in exile. And you imagine if you have a flux of people that come into your country one of the first things you have to do is you have to teach them the law of that land. Now, I know that that might not be what we do here, but it should be. And the, the thing that you have to, or at least I believe I understood, was that when Christ returns back to this earth, those multitudes of people, many of them are not going to know what in the world just took place, whether... Uh, they were Christian or whether they were some other religion or whether they were no religion, they're going to come to understand that this is the way things are. And they're going to have to understand that law. And I believe that's where you and I hopefully come in. That right now as we're going through this life that we have on this earth, hopefully we're developing that understanding heart, that ability to judge righteously, that ability to, to, to not just listen to people's problems and then give our opinion, but to listen to people's problems or our own problems and go to the Word of God and try to find the answer. Let's go over to Psalms chapter 37. And in Psalms chapter 37, we're going to start in verse 27. It says, Depart from evil and do good, and live forevermore. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the earth and dwell in it forever. The mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom, and his tongue talks of justice. The law of his God is in his heart, and none of his steps shall slide. We go back to that, that law being written on our hearts. It's not enough for us just to know the letter of the law. You know, one of the, I don't have this verse written down, but Christ said that our righteousness must exceed that of the Pharisees. And they knew the law. But we have to understand how to judge righteously and how to have mercy and know the spirit of the law. You know, when you think about it, when Christ returns and what we're reading here in Psalms, I know uh, in uh, Neil's message earlier this week, he uh, talked about in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 35, you don't have to turn there, but he talked about how Christ realized when he was preaching to the multitudes and, and healing them, that the harvest was great, but the workers were few. That won't be the situation when he returns. The workers will be many. He will have individuals 
that are his brothers and sisters that are able to work on side of him to help teach the law, judge, help people rebuild those, those cities that, that we read about also earlier this week. These individuals won't be blind judges holding scales from some pagan goddess dating you know, back to Egypt. They will actually be able to look upon the person, their, their heart, and they'll be able to relate to them. Just as Christ had to come and live in the flesh so that he could relate with you and I, we'll be able to relate with them because you and I would have walked in the flesh and had various sins that we had to overcome. These individuals that will be working with Christ will be, hopefully, you and I, his sisters and brothers. So um, hopefully this time of the Feast of the Tabernacles that we're here, take some time, if you can, and, and, and read in the Scripture about the law. Try to, to, to learn from it. Do as Solomon did. Go to God in prayer and ask for an understanding heart. Because one of the things that you and I have to come to understand and, and do a better job at is judging righteously. And it's, it's not something that happens overnight. It's a process. And hopefully it's a process that we can accomplish in our lifetime.